and we're finishing with Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus in the in uh, under pressure. Jesus in the in the furnace time of, of of life where faith is in that pressurized situation. Well, yes, and I can think of a number of places, but the the most significant place is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and as we look at Jesus in the garden, we will discover ways that he dealt with being in the furnace and persevering faith and how we can do that as well. So I look forward uh, to this this morning as we uh, close out this topic, this series of furnace faith. We're going to begin in verse 32. And I want uh, you to remember that we will have our scripture reading, we'll light our candles, and then we'll kneel here at the altar and pray for revival that starts this next Sunday uh, with Michael Mason, and then we have a couple of weeks, and then we'll have our community revival. And so I look forward to that. So would you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word? We're looking at Mark chapter 14. <clears throat> We're going to begin in the 32nd verse. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And he went a little beyond them, fell to the ground, and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. May God continue to bless the public reading of his word. Would you join with me? We light these candles each and every week to remind us to pray for our servicemen and women, our law enforcement personnel, and we do lift them in prayer every week. These that are God's instruments to see to our safety, our protection, our welfare and well-being. We thank God for them. And we also began lighting this candle to remind us to pray for not only our revival here as a congregation, but our community revival meetings that are coming up. And if you would like to join me, would you come now and kneel with me here as we ask God's presence and as we ask God's blessing on this revival. Uh, we want to seek God's face as a congregation. And if you can't kneel, that's fine. You pray with us where you are. Father God, we've been singing about the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And for every believer, we have been washed in that blood. It's been applied to our lives. And your Holy Spirit indwells us. And Father, we need a fresh energizing by your Holy Spirit. And that requires our surrender, first of all, to your Spirit's leadership control in our lives. And that's really what revival is all about. It's being brought to newness of life, freshness of life. And so, Father, we plead for revival in this place. 
We plead for revival in our community. That your churches would be revived, renewed and restored. That your love would overflow in our hearts. That we would be passionate and zealous for you, O oh God, first of all, and then for the lost, secondly. We do thank you that we can have revival meetings. That's made possible by our law enforcement, our military personnel. We thank you for them. We pray for them. We lift them to you. And we pray for encouragement, strength, and courage, healing, restoration for their family members and those who've been traumatized in some way or another, physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it may be. You would heal and restore them. Mostly that they would know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We lift our military and law enforcement families to you and we commend them into thy care. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the coming of Christ Jesus. Until he comes, you've given us a job to do. And that's to be busy proclaiming the good news of liberty in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness of sin, eternal life, joy unspeakable, purpose and meaning, love that never ends. Forgive our failures, Lord. We do stumble. Thank you, you've made provision for that. That Christ Jesus, our Lord, ever pleads our case before your throne. Thank you, Lord. Be with us now as we study your word. Bless your people as we seek your face. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. All God's people say, amen. amen. Faith in the times of furnace living, that is where the pressure is put on, that's where the flames are leaping up. And if you look at Jesus' approach to this, I think that you will see some similarities to every believer who has walked very long in the faith and, and has been put through times of the furnace. And I want you to notice before we do anything, go back to this very first passage of Scripture, Mark 14, verse 32. If you would put that on, thank you so much. And they came to a place named Gethsemane. It was a garden. Actually, it is an olive grove. The word Gethsemane means oil press. There was an olive press there. How appropriate. Because this was a time of extreme pressure and stress for Christ Jesus. Imagine if you would, never having surrendered to temptation, ever. I have never done that. I have failed many times. How about you? Yeah, all right. Jesus never did. I don't know what it's like not to fail. Because I have failed in life. So have you. I have stumbled. So have you. Jesus never did. Now, the worst temptation that you have ever felt... And you didn't surrender to it. Do you remember the stress? Do you remember how hard it was to walk away? Do you remember the difficulty? Do you remember the agony of it? Now imagine never having surrendered to sin at all. Stretched. Because you must remember, yes, he is the son incarnate, but still a person. Otherwise, he does not live as we live. Otherwise, he hasn't experienced what we experience. He's fully human. Fully divine, yes, but fully human too. Two natures, one person. And in his humanness, temptation is real. And he's in this garden, this pressure place, this place called an oil press and he is going to be pressed in the extreme he says to the disciples sit here until I have what prayed he is coming into the place of pressure coming into the place where the flames leap up coming into the place where he is going to be pressed so severely and what does he do how does he approach it how does he face it with what prayer he gathered his close ones around him. He went to this place, as was his custom, as we know from Scripture, to go to this place. But in verse 33, and he took with him 
Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Those were his three closest of all of the disciples. Those were the inner three. Peter, James, and John. And he took them aside. He took with him Peter and James and John, began to be very distressed and troubled. Let me explain that to you. He said he began to be very distressed. That word in the Greek is always used in the passive tense in the New Testament, which means this was being done to him. Okay? Get that image in your mind. He has come to the place of stress. He has come to the place of the furnace. And this distressing is being placed upon him. His response to that distress is, it troubled him. Have you been there? Where the distress or stress has been put upon you. You didn't seek it. It might not be any any fault of yours. Through no stumbling of your own. But you find yourself in the oil press and the stress is there and it troubles you now watch verse 34 and he said to them my soul is deeply grieved in his innermost being he says to those three he didn't share it with the others he shared it with these three because he's going to ask something of them and that's, that's important He said to them, my soul, in my innermost being, we would say my heart. And when we say the word grief, what do you automatically think of? You think of death, right? Well, I think that's significant to the point of death. I am to grieve like if someone had passed away. But the word means a deep sorrow. He is experiencing a deep and troubling sorrow. To the point where I feel like I'm going to die. Have you ever felt like that? Because I have. Have you ever felt like the sorrow was so overwhelming that you thought you were just going to die? Now, watch what he says. Because this is important. He said to them, remain here. Stay right over here. And keep watch. So the first thing I want you to notice is his request for prayer. When Jesus is facing, and he knows he's facing it because he is the Son of God, in his humanness, however, he has to pass through this. And he comes to that place of stress, that place of pressure, that place of torment, and he gathers his loved ones around him, He takes those that are closest to him and he goes off a little distance and he tells them and he pours out his heart to them. The first step in the furnace for persevering faith is to remember, take those that are close to you that you trust to pray and you take them with you and you say, dear ones, this is what's going on in my heart. I am so stressed that has come upon me I am so deeply sorrowful that I feel like I'm going to die. We too often try to carry that alone. And if we do, then our enemy, the devil, has us exactly where he wants us because we're easy prey alone. And you know, the first thing you want to do when you are in that situation, when that sorrow is overwhelming, when you are moved to the point of death, is to shut down, not share it with anyone, and to go off by yourself and try to deal with it. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Because there the enemy will whisper to you. There the enemy will pick you off easily. Jesus in this moment points to us what we need to do. If the Son of God requested prayer, how much more should we request prayer? We don't avail ourselves of prayer nearly enough. We don't come to the throne nearly enough. We don't come to the throne expecting 
power to be delivered. We don't come to the throne expecting to be liberated. We don't come to the throne expecting persevering grace. We try to handle it in our own strength, our own ability. Because we feel like we are announcing failure if we share with those that we love. And this is a lie straight from the devil. We feel like we are admitting failure if we say the stress is too much for me. I am so moved in my spirit, in my soul with sorrow that I feel like if I take another breath, it's going to be my last. I'm going to die if something doesn't change. And we try to bottle that up and we try to hide it because we don't want anyone to think we are a weak Christian. Do you think of Jesus as weak when he asked them to pray with him? I don't. I don't think of him as weak at all. I think he's given us a pattern that we should follow. That is a myth to say you've got to do it. There's no such thing in the scripture of Lone Ranger Christians. There's no such thing as that. We're in this together. And if the devil can separate us, well, then he's accomplished much. Jesus requested prayer. He said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Thirdly, secondly, I want you to notice there's a a repeated prayer. He repeated his prayer three times, and you know what the prayer is. You know what the prayer is. What was he praying about? Father, if it is possible, let this hour pass from me. What hour? The hour of becoming sin, the hour of my sin being placed on him, your sin being placed on him. It was not the death, it was not the cross, it was not the torture that bothered him nearly. It was the thought of all of that black, horrid, sickening filth dumped upon him that turned his stomach. Father, oh, Father, if it is possible. Can you imagine, just for a moment, all of the filth and mire and muck of every sin of every human being that has ever lived placed upon him? Can you imagine that? Mine is bad enough. Mine plus yours is tremendous. Mine plus yours and every other human being that's ever lived will live. I can't get my mind around that, can you? I can't. That the Son of God would do that. That the Father would allow that. That the Father would even plan that. From the very beginning is amazing to me. What love is expressed. And he repeats this prayer three times in the Jewish way. You remember when the Apostle Paul prayed, we looked at him in the furnace, his thorn, we don't know what it was, but how many times did he pray for God to remove it? How many times? Three times. The Jewish way. It's in a matter of intense prayer to repeat this three times. He prayed about it three times. That's the Jewish pattern, to pray three times. And with Paul, the Father said, no, but my grace is sufficient for you. Jesus repeats his prayer. If it is possible that this hour might pass him by. And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for thee. Remove this cup from me. What cup? The cup of wrath. The wrath of the Father that was going to be poured out upon him. The wrath that you and I justly deserve. The wrath that by grace missed us and fell on him. Remove this cup from me. He prayed that prayer three times that night. And I find it remarkable that we know what he said. Don't you? Now, that's a short prayer. Luke, the doctor, tells us that he was praying so intensely that what happened? You remember? Capillaries in his skin started breaking, and sweat and blood mixed together and fell down on the ground in globs. I'm going to admit to you, I pray, but I've never prayed like that. You ever prayed like that? I've never prayed so intensely that capillaries started breaking in my skin. 
You know why I think we have just a few words of that prayer? I don't think he could get that intense just saying, Father, take this cup from me. Let this hour pass from me. That's short. So he set the disciples down, and this is we, it, it, it reads this way. He said, Peter, James, and John, y'all watch and pray with me. I, I'm distressed. Sorrow, grief is overcoming me. They didn't understand. I get that. So he walks over here. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Let this hour not come to me. And he goes back. It happened that quickly? I don't think so. I think he set the disciples down. He walked over a few feet, and they heard the beginning of his prayer. And they fell asleep. We only get the first part of the prayer. I think he prayed for a long time. Half hour, hour, who knows? Intensely sweating, pouring down. It would have been cool in Israel that time of year. He comes back. And he can't believe it, they're asleep. Couldn't, couldn't you watch him pray? He goes back and, and we get the beginnings of it again. Abba, Father. And they go back to sleep. The only part we got is the first part. He was intensely praying. Oh, dear friend, when you're in the furnace, let me ask you a question. How many of you would say with me, I have been in those furnace times of life? Would you raise your hand? You've been in those times? I've been in those times. Let me ask you this question. Did you pray intensely in those times? Yes, you did. That is the most intense prayer I've ever had is in those times of the furnace. Now, if I know what intense prayer is, can you imagine what Jesus was struggling with? So it's a repeated prayer. Over and over and over again, he's praying this prayer. Not just a couple of seconds, not just a couple of sentences, but intensely praying over and over and over to the degree that he's sweating, to the degree that capillaries are breaking and blood is mingling with sweat, to the degree that he is overwhelmed, that his strength is being poured out. I know this is true because the Father sent an angel to minister to him. How do we know that? Because scriptures tell us that he did. That's how intensely he was praying. To support him, to strengthen him. Why? Because salvation is on the line. The devil is there. The devil is always there when the furnace is on. He's always present. He's always there in the times of the furnace. And we seem to be able to hear him more clearly than anyone else. Isn't that right? In those times of the furnace, we struggle to hear God, but we can hear the enemy loud and clear, can't we? Oh, don't you, don't you doubt that the enemy was there in the Garden of Gethsemane? He was there. And he'd be there for you, too. That's why it's imperative that you have others praying for you. That's why it's imperative that you yourself are intensely praying because the enemy is coming against you. Thirdly, I want you to see this rank failure of the disciples. Rank failure. That word rank means it smell bad. And it did smell bad. It stunk. This failure stinks. But it also means the rank of order. And I mean that in the sense that every one of them failed. Every one of them failed. Jesus takes them and says, pray with me. Watch with me. And I know he was praying for at least an hour because he came back and he said, couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? First time he went off and left them, he prayed for at least an hour. Intensely praying. And they've been sleeping for about 50 minutes of it because they only heard the first couple of sentences. Now, what did Jesus tell them? He came to them and found them sleeping, verse 37, and said to Peter, Simon, and that's significant that he didn't call him Peter because that's his nickname. That's the name Jesus called him. That's the nickname Jesus gave him, Peter. And when he calls him Simon, He's getting his attention. You're not acting like Peter now. You're acting like yourself. You're acting like your old self, Simon. Simon, did you know the scriptures tell us that each one of us has a name? 
God has a name for each one of us. Did you know that? It's not going to be revealed to you till you get to heaven, but you've got a name that's descriptive of you, that's unique to you. And I think God calls us by that name. We just don't hear it very well, but I've heard him call me Rick. You see, when he calls me Rick, that's not his nickname for me. That's when I'm acting like me. That's the same with Peter. Simon, you're not acting like Peter. You're not acting like the changed man I've called you to be. You're acting like Simon, your old self. Simon, couldn't you keep watch? And that means to be vigilant, alert. Couldn't you keep alert for one hour? Watch and pray. Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. Now catch this. The spirit is willing. What's weak? The flesh is weak. You and I are weak. In this body, we're weak. My spirit is always willing. My spirit is always willing to serve the Lord. My spirit is always willing to sing joyful praises to God. My spirit is always willing to live triumphantly, victoriously. My spirit is always willing to be faithful and true. But my flesh is weak. And what does he say? Be on the alert. Watch. Keep praying. Keep staying alert. Failure's around the corner. How do we avoid failure? How do we avoid stumbling? How do we avoid? What did he say? Keep watching and keep praying lest you be overcome by temptation. Keep watching, keep praying. Isn't it just like the Lord? He's asked them to pray for him. But he comes to them and says, so that you're not overcome. Keep watching and praying. What was Jesus' response to entering into the furnace? Prayer. How did he go about that prayer? He gathered faithful around him to pray with him and ask them to pray. Now they failed. Hopefully those you gather won't fail. But I think this is a reminder to us that if we are to succeed, we must recognize that the flesh is weak, though the spirit is willing. Don't ever just settle, my spirit is willing. Don't stop there. Because your flesh cannot carry your spirit. Only the Spirit of God can carry your spirit. And unless we are entering into that time with prayer, acknowledging our weakness, asking God to fill us with His Spirit, not to indwell us with His Spirit, that's constant, but to fill us and to surrender in those moments. Our flesh is too weak. We'll be overcome. Oh, there was rank failure. But now I want to end with this. This resplendent surrender of Christ Jesus. Resplendent, if you're from Union City, you don't know what that means. Resplendent means to shine marvelously, to shine radiantly. It comes from the Latin. To relight. Resplendere. In this dark garden, with the failure of the disciples. Their failure to discern the situation they were in, their failure to realize what was around the corner, their failure to heed the Lord's command to pray and to be alert. And by the way, when we fail, that's exactly the reason we fail. Because we failed to discern the situation. We failed to hear the word of God. We failed to be obedient to the word. But in the midst of that failure and darkness, there is this resplendent surrender of Christ Jesus. You remember what he said? Not my will, but whose will? Thy will be done. You see, when you're in the furnace, the first thing you want to do is get out, right? And you want to get out right quick. You don't want to stay there. The pressure's on, the heat is turned up, the stress is overwhelming. 
The sorrow is washing over. You feel like I'm going to die if it doesn't change. If I don't get out of this, I can't stand it anymore. And when you go to God, you're being obedient to the word of the Lord. You're praying intentionally. You've got people praying with you. You've shared that with prayer warriors. The thing that must come from your heart is this. Lord, you know, I don't want to be in this situation any longer. If it is possible, let this pass from me. But not my will. Your will be done. You see, because if it's your will... It leads to failure. That's disobedience. Remember this truth, because it is true. God may not deliver you from the furnace. Got it? He may not. But he will always deliver you through the furnace. All right? He may not deliver you from it. He will always see you through it. I just did uh, the funeral for a dear friend. I've watched him suffer for the past two or three years. He had a disease that caused his lungs to harden so that they couldn't get oxygen into his system. The last time I saw him about a week ago, he said, I just don't understand why I haven't been healed. He's a man of faith, a man of prayer, a godly man. But he was failing. His strength was faltering. He only had a week to live. And he was tired. He was tired of being in that furnace. He was tired of the stress and the sorrow and the grief. He was tired physically and emotionally and spiritually. He was drained. And he said, Brother Rick, the devil... It's just working me over. And at night when I can't sleep, the devil is working me over. And we prayed. We prayed for his deliverance. If God chose to heal him, fine and dandy. If God didn't, that God would see him through. Now you can say what you will. I believe God saw him through. Because they had told him his death would be horrible. Horrible. He would be gasping for air, struggling to breathe. Do you know how he passed away? He was sitting there. He asked his wife to rub his neck. She said, all right. She rubbed his neck. She okay. Lifted his chin, dang it again. He was gone. God saw him through the furnace, friend. And he's more alive now than he ever has been. Listen. Don't let those circumstances turn you away from God. Run to God. He may not deliver you out of it, but he will always deliver you through it. All right? Listen, friend. Jesus approached the furnace with prayer, with prayer warriors, with obedience to the Father's will. Not my will, but thine. Lord, you can deliver me out of this if you will. If you won't, see me through it. His grace will be sufficient.